works, apparently. So Rachel Payne, Esther Schubert, Diana Velika, Mariana Ramirez Herrera, Julia Hanny, Zorka Millen, Matt Lindauer, Shmulik Nili, Gila Tanai, Amy Gordon, Christian Gogu, Victor Mutai, and Alexandra Budiman, Daniel Matias, and Farsan Gassim. So these are the people who have helped us organize the conference, and we should give them a hand and thank them. OK, so we've heard already quite a bit about uh, this conflict, if you like, or tension between political focus on the one hand and academic creativity on the other. And maybe I summarize that again uh, the way I would summarize it, that on the one hand, to be successful as academics, we, and this is a distributive we, each of us, must distinguish oneself, ourselves, by developing new views on existing issues. We have to disagree with those who have worked on these same issues before, or else we have to pioneer altogether new issues. Right? It's not good enough just to say, I agree with Rawls, or I agree with a shoe or something like that, you have to have your own distinctive line. On the other hand, in order to be successful in promoting justice, we, and this is now a collective we, must focus our energies upon a politically achievable goal or a schedule of goals and then collaborate in realizing this goal together. And those two things are in tension because you will not be academically rewarded if you just support somebody else's project. Now, one thing that might overcome that to some extent, or at least that's what I've done in recent years, is uh, to do something you might call engineering research. You say, here's an idea that looks good on paper, but we need to get this idea to the point where it can actually be implemented. And in order to do that, we have to try it on a small scale. We have to refine it. We have to test it with various relevant uh, target audiences. So for example, we have to take it into the developing world and so forth. Uh, try it out. The Health Impact Fund is obviously an example of that. I told you yesterday about the uh, pilot project that we are now doing in India. And here we can say, look, you know, we had this nice idea, but important research yet needs to be done in order to see whether this idea can actually work, whether we can come up with a health metric, health gains metric that could apl be applied to different uh, diseases, different uh, medical interventions in different parts of the world, feasibly with uh, a cost that is bearable, that is not too high in comparison to the reward money that would be paid out and so forth. So that's just one example. And that's real research, or at least we can present that as real important research where creative people can work together to actually make something happen. I call it engineering research to allude to the kind of thing that engineers are doing, right? So a physicist comes up with the idea that you could actually build a bridge over a river, but so far that's just a piece of paper, and so an engineer will have to go about and sort of see whether we can find materials of the requisite strength, how we can design the bridge, how it would work so that the materials would, you know, that the, the stress on the bridge would not be too great, blah, 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 you all know the point. So that's uh, one way in which we can maybe overcome this problem. Now on the whole, as I've said before, I think we've been pretty grotesquely ineffective over the last 30 years or so. The last 30, 35 years have been uh, a period of rearguard battles of, you know, yeah, there was some rhetoric about the MDGs and there have been summits and working groups and high level this and so forth human rights declarations, but net-net, if you look at the actual results on the ground, it's been terrible, right? Already in the 1970s, people have talked about the end of poverty and how we now are in a position to uh, do very much better and so forth, and it just hasn't happened. And the question then is, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, why hasn't it happened? Why haven't we been more effective in translating what are pretty clear moral imperatives into actual results on the ground? And I think one important part of the answer is what I said two days ago about these inequality spirals, regulatory <coughs> capture, and so forth. 
And that's a process that involves both substance and, and process, right? That on the one hand, we have procedures, governance procedures, decision-making procedures, institutional design procedures that simply do not uh, allow for input from morally motivated agents and let alone from people affected. A lot of the poorer people in this world affected by these decisions are not really given a chance to weigh in on them and their needs and interests are excluded from that decision making. And on the other hand, we have an, a distribution, distributional outcomes that tilt the balance of power ever further in the direction of a relatively small global elite and relatively small national elites in the various countries. So uh, a dramatic example, again, one that I've given before, is the reversal in the trend of income inequality, in particular in the United States, where it's most dramatic, where we had a steady decline in inequality between 1928 and 1980, roughly, and since then, a very steady increase in inequality that has brought us back to the peak that was once reached just before the Great Depression. So. Uh, a point that is closely connected to that, of course, is that there are very well-resourced and very sophisticated, prudentially motivated agents who are very effective in trying to increase their share of national and global household income or, in general, their share of the social product. And the TRIPS agreement is one example of many, but it's an example that I happen to know a little bit more about, so I say maybe a sentence or two about it. It was four industry groups that got together in the 1990s, the IP-heavy industries, pharmaceuticals, agribusinesses, software, and entertainment. They got together, they had their differences, they didn't really have exactly the same concerns and priorities, but they overcame these differences, they negotiated until they had a common platform and then they rammed that common platform down the throats of the folks in Washington, Clinton first and foremost, and said to Clinton, you know, you have to do one thing for us and that is when you go and negotiate this trade agreement, you have to bring us home this intellectual property agreement that we want. Never mind that it isn't a trade issue particularly, but we want this done, this is what you have to bring us. And Clinton delivered. So what we haven't managed to do is we have been singularly ineffective in uniting behind a common platform, right? We have celebrated our diversity and there is a lot to celebrate. I'm not against diversity, but the paradigmatic events on our side of this have been uh, the World Social Forum events where 100,000 flowers flumed, uh, bloomed, everybody had their own idea. And we all delighted in the fact that we have been to this wonderful event where all these wonderful people have had all these wonderful ideas about this, that, and the other thing. But of course, none of these ideas acquired the kind of critical mass that would get it political attention and would get it implemented. So what then is the precondition for successfully promoting justice in the world? How can we actually have impact? I think the key is here to select some priority goal. And a priority goal doesn't need to be the only goal that we promote. It could be part of a schedule of goals, of an agenda, but we have to bring them into a plausible sequence and we have to concentrate our forces, sorry for the military terminology, concentrate our forces on one thing at a time, get that thing accomplished, get a run on the board, and then go on to the next goal after that. And I think that's the key. How do we select the first priority goal? Where do we start? And I think three important considerations are first, the intrinsic importance of the goal. We want to start with something significant, something important that, has, that would really make a difference to people on the ground that kind of illustrates to the world what it is that we are all about. Second, it should be something that's achievable. So pick something uh, not sort of the hardest goal right at the beginning, pick something, not something uh, very, very small, but something that's significant, that would really make a splash, but is definitely achievable. And third, something that is strategic in the sense that achieving it would then open up new pathways to achieve additional things. 
So let me say a little bit about numbers two and three because they are not quite obvious what falls under them. Under achievability, I have in mind that it is inspirational, so it's a victory for morally motivated agents. People will see this as a big uh, achievement and will be motivated to join a movement that carries this forward. It should also be appealing to some powerful prudentially motivated agents. So I think one big mistake that many people make on the more progressive side of the political spectrum is to see the other side as this homogeneous glob, this big black box of evil that uh, where they're all pulling in the same direction, they're all marching in lockstep. What we should realize is if they do march in lockstep, that's an achievement on they, their part. They've uh, overcome their differences, they've negotiated, they have uh, formed themselves into some politically effective alliance. Their interests are not naturally aligned and it would be good for us to pick as a first target something where we can count on the support of at least some of these powerful forces who may not be motivated morally at all, but will have a prudential reason to support us. So if it's good to have a morally suitable target where we can also have arguments from efficiency, for example, we can say the present way of doing it is just totally wasteful and if we did it in this other way, we could release tremendous numbers, you know, tremendous resources that would be good for the poor, but could also bring benefits to other agents, for example. And then thirdly, we look for something where the resistance that we can expect from those defenders of the status quo is not gonna be all that great partly maybe because they are too embarrassed to fight against something that is so morally compelling, and partly simply because there isn't all that much at stake for them. So these would be ways of picking, uh, if you like, a soft, achievable target. And then as far as the strategic point is concerned, that it should facilitate the realization of other important goals one point here is that we have something distinctive that's a signature goal, something that isn't already around, but something that we gather around and that very clearly uh, can then be shown to be our victory, our achievement, rather than that we help to achieve something that already certain factions of the elites were pushing for. Secondly, it should be capable of serving as a model in that something similar might work in other areas, for example, that if this were to be achieved, if it worked reasonably well, we could try to use it in some other domain or in some other geographical region or something like that. And thirdly, it should shift the distribution of power. It should be an empowering thing in particular for our clearest and most natural allies, namely the people in the lower half of the human income distribution. It should empower people who could then help us achieve additional institutional reforms. So, and then you could say here are some examples, or at least, you know, I've thought about this for quite a long time, and uh, this doesn't mean that this is all, all that brilliant, but the point is I've tried to focus on issues where these criteria are fulfilled, and issues where you could build a large coalition consisting of NGOs, of progressive politicians and policy makers, of intellectuals and ordinary citizens. And among the things that I think are most promising that I can see are the following four. So in the global health arena, the Health Impact Fund I think would be a good idea because the Health Impact Fund would be a good model, as I said yesterday, uh, that you could carry into food production <coughs> into environmental issues, green technologies, and uh, also into environmental, yeah, green technologies and also into education. Uh, it's also something that would empower poor people. It would uh, get rid of some of the great problems that are burdening them and making it harder for them to exert political influence. Uh, a second one would be in the illicit financial flows area, uh, something like automatic information exchange, in particular also including the poorer countries, not just exchange of information among the 
wealthy countries, but including the poorer countries, or the other example that I gave was an alternative minimum tax for multinational corporations with the funding going into a human development fund. So that would be a second idea. This alternative minimum tax idea is maybe uh, original enough and again has a certain model function and so on. So that could conceivably be a goal around which a lot of political support could be gathered. Uh, one could think of a trade fairness goal, so saying that if protectionism cannot be completely abolished, at least there should be a tax on it or something like a tax, a fee if you like, that would make it up to those countries that whose export opportunities are undermined by these protectionist measures such as tariffs, anti-dumping duties, quotas, subsidies, export credits and so forth that the rich countries are still maintaining. And again, that's a relatively soft target because pretty much everybody, pretty much every economist, people on the right, people on the left, everybody agrees that protectionism is a bad thing. And uh, people then say, well, it's just politically very difficult uh, with the various affluent nations to get them to abandon certain industries that they, for cultural reasons, are very attached to, like, for example, the famous cows in Switzerland. But we can counter that argument by saying, if the Swiss want to have their cows, that's fine. But at least let them pay something to make it up to poor countries who are losing export opportunities as a consequence of those cows. And then the fourth one would, of course, be some environmental goal. So something like a phase out or ultimately an international ban on the environmentally most damaging fossil fuel extraction activities, such as, for example, coal, which we shouldn't be using anymore given how ineffective and inefficient it is, how much greenhouse gas emissions come out of coal relative to the energy that coal is uh, delivering. And similarly with fracking and the so-called tar sands that are also uh, much more polluting relative to the units of energy that they deliver than ordinary oil. So the demand could be let's use up most or even all of the ordinary simple oil that is still in the ground, but let's not go to these other technologies that are ecologically much more harmful and uh, for a given output in energy. So these would be candidates. I could go back to the preceding slides and, and show you how they fit these criteria that I gave, but I think it's pretty obvious, a pretty obvious exercise. And that's just my closing point, that we should think along these strategic lines and see whether we can't form some sort of an alliance around goals of that sort, prioritize one in particular, and then work together with uh, large movements. I'm thinking of movements like Awats, uh, the rules, moveon.org. These kinds of movements that can mobilize large numbers of people to really hone in on one of these goals and get it accomplished. I think that would be the beginning of what potentially could be the end of poverty indeed. Thank you. Thank you.